This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for July 3rd through the 9th. On this week's show, John meets Paul, two musicians die under controversial circumstances, and we say happy birthday to one of the most eclectic performers around. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. This first story is about chance encounters and being prepared. Now, I'm not a man who believes in fate or luck. To me, luck is just recognizing, being prepared for, and then taking advantage of the opportunity that comes your way. Same thing with fate. I think that the actions that you take set you up for what people believe is fate. But what does either of those have to do with music? Well, as it turns out, basically everything. On July 6th, 1957, there was a small annual church picnic in Liverpool, England. At the time, John Lennon had a band called the Quarrymen. The only reason why his group was playing at the festival was because of a family connection to the people who decided to add a band to their picnic. Fate, you say? No, family connections, that's all. Now, Also at this picnic was a young lad named Paul McCartney. Paul was there to check out the scene. Paul watched the quarrymen play, and while he liked the band, he really liked John. John wasn't the best guitarist around, but he knew how to hold an audience with his charm. Paul was immediately struck by John's talent, and after the show, a mutual friend introduced Paul to John. Fate, you say? No, connections again. Anyway, while Paul was hanging out with the band, no one paid attention to him. That is, until Paul brought out his guitar that he carried around with him most of the time and began playing. John now was the guy who was struck by someone else's talent, Paul's. And even though Paul was two years younger, Paul was a much better guitar player. Paul even taught John how to write down music onto sheet music paper and how to properly tune a guitar. John asked Paul to join the Quarrymen two weeks later, and the rest, as you know, is Beatles history. Now, there's a lot in that story. For starters, what if Paul wasn't carrying his guitar that day? Well, as any creative will tell you, if you carry your tools of choice, be it a camera or a guitar, you carry it everywhere with you. Hell, you're practically married to the thing. Paul was that type of creative. What if Paul had not practiced his guitar pretty much nonstop? Then he wouldn't have impressed John that day. Luck is preparation meeting opportunity. It wasn't luck that got the two of them together. It was connections to the both of them that made the meeting possible, and it was Paul's preparation that turned the encounter into the birth of the Beatles and one of the greatest music partnerships of all time. And it all started on July 6th, 1957. Barry Eugene Carter was born in 1944 in Texas. During his teens, he and his brother were in a gang. His brother was killed by another gang member, and Barry ended up doing a little time in jail for stealing tires. It was while he was in jail that he first heard Elvis Presley's song, It's Now or Never. Barry said that it changed his life completely. Once out of jail, Barry decided to become a singer. He started doing backup vocals and then started recording his own songs. He ended up working as an A&R guy for Delphi Records, developing, writing, and producing songs for other artists. By this time, he was known by what we all know him as today... Barry White. In the early 1970s, Barry was working with a Supreme style group called Love Unlimited. In 1972, they had a hit called Walking in the Rain with the One I Love. He then ended up switching record labels and went to 20th Century Records. And it was there where his solo recording career flourished. 
Starting in 1973, he started racking up hits on the R&B charts like Never Gonna Give You Up, Can't Get Enough of Your Love, It's Ecstasy When You're Next to Me, and You're the First, the Last, My Everything. Barry's deep voice and smooth vocals and orchestral arrangements made him one of the preeminent R&B singers and producers of the 1970s until his death on July 4th, Independence Day, 2003, at the age of 58. The man's voice and smooth vocal style is probably responsible for one-tenth of the world's population considering how many people have sex to his music. Seriously. Worldwide, he had 20 gold and 10 platinum singles, plus 106 gold albums with 41 of those albums actually going platinum. Yet, shockingly, Barry White is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yet. I always thought he was in, so it kind of shocked me when he ended up on a list of biggest Hall of Fame snubs. Go figure. Barry White... The legendary Barry White, passing away on July 4th, 2003, from a variety of health issues at the age of 58. Next, Louis Armstrong's story begins in the musical melting pot of New Orleans, Louisiana, or Norlands as they call it. Exposed to ragtime, blues, and brass band music from a young age, he developed a natural musicality. A defining moment came when he was sent to the Colored Waifs Home for Boys, where he learned to play the cornet, igniting a lifelong passion of his. Armstrong's early professional life saw him honing his skills on Mississippi riverboats and playing alongside legendary musicians like Joe King Oliver. His innovative approach to the cornet, characterized by improvisation, a powerful sound, and a focus on melody, set him apart from everybody else. He wasn't just playing regular notes. He was actually giving those notes emotion and personality. In the 1920s, Armstrong moved to Chicago and joined Fletcher Henderson's orchestra. And there, his groundbreaking techniques flourished, particularly his use of scat singing, which was improvisational vocalization that mimicked instrumental sounds. This innovative technique became a defining element of jazz singing. Armstrong's most influential recordings came with his own bands, the Hot Five and the Hot Seven. These groups pushed the boundaries of jazz music with Armstrong's improvisational solos and expressive vocals taking center stage. Tracks like West End Blues, which is still considered to this day to be the most important jazz recording of all time, and Heebie Jeebies, showcased his revolutionary approach forever changing the way jazz was played and listened to. By the 1930s, Louis' fame had transcended jazz. He appeared in movies, toured internationally, and he became, along the way, a cultural icon. His charismatic personality, infectious smile, and trademark gravelly voice captivated audiences worldwide. He became known as Satchmo, and then later he was nicknamed Ambassador Satch, a testament to his role in promoting American music all over the world. However, Louis' career was not without, let's say, its complexities. As a black musician in a segregated America, he faced racial barriers and criticism for his upbeat persona. Despite these challenges, he continued to break down barriers and inspired multi-generations of musicians along racial lines and across racial lines as well. Louis' genius wasn't limited to just doing solo performances. He thrived on collaboration. His charisma and his musicality was sparking magic whenever he was paired with other artists. Probably Louis' most celebrated collaboration was with the First Lady of Song, Miss Ella Fitzgerald. Their paths crossed in the mid-1940s, and their instant musical connection led to a series of recordings that remain classics to this day. 
the albums Ella and Louie from 1956, Ella and Louie again from 1957, and Porgy and Bess from 1959 showcased their playful banter and unmatched vocal skills. Armstrong's gravelly charm perfectly complemented Ella's scatting and soaring vocals, which created a joyful and dynamic sound. These recordings not only brought jazz to a much wider audience, but also solidified Louis's reputation as a master collaborator. While his pairing with Ella is iconic, Louis's collaborative spirit extended far beyond just working with vocalists. He worked with a diverse range of musicians, each bringing out a different facet of his talent. Early in his career, he performed with big bands that were led by Fletcher Henderson and Louis Russell, honing his improvisational skill and developing what became known as his signature trumpet style. He also collaborated with pianist Earl Fatha Hines and Oscar Peterson, creating exciting and virtuosic duets. Louis' collaborative spirit wasn't even held by just being in the jazz genre. He famously recorded with Bing Crosby, a collaboration that initially raised eyebrows due to their racial and stylistic differences. But yet, their recordings, such as Pennies from Heaven and Here Comes the Groom, showcase their mutual respect for each other and their ability to find common ground through music. He even experimented with yodeling with Leon Thomas, demonstrating his openness to new musical experiences. Louis' collaborations weren't simply about creating hit songs. They were about fostering a love for music and breaking down barriers. He inspired countless musicians from jazz vocalists like Billie Holiday to singers like Frank Sinatra. His collaborations served as a masterclass in improvisation, communication, and the joy of music making. Louis' influence wasn't confined to just jazz. His vocal style and stage presence paved the way for generations of singers, including Elvis Presley and Ray Charles. Songs like What a Wonderful World and Hello, Dolly transcended genres, becoming timeless classics that eventually became loved around the world. His trumpet playing, with its virtuosity and expressiveness, inspired countless musicians shaping the evolution of popular music. When Louis Armstrong passed away on July 6, 1971 from heart issues, his impact on music and American pop culture was immeasurable. He redefined jazz, popularized scat singing, and brought joy to millions through his music and personality. His life served as a testament to the power of music to transcend barriers and to unite people at the same time. Today, Louis remains a beloved figure, his infectious spirit and music continuing to inspire generations of listeners and musicians alike. The man they call Satchmo, one of the most important entertainers of jazz and 20th century music, Mr. Louis Armstrong passed away on July 6th, 1971 from heart issues at the age of 69. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Next, we're going to talk about two different records which both made their marks, but for different reasons. First off, the original nicknames to this group were DJ Run, Don of Curtis Blow, Easy D, and Jazzy Jace. In the very early 1980s, there were three kids who grew up in Hollis, Queens. 
Joseph Simmons had an older brother named Russell, who was a hip-hop promoter and had started a record label with his college roommate, Rick Rubin, called Def Jam Records. Russell at the time promoted rapper Curtis Blow and needed someone to be Curtis's DJ. Joseph was recruited to be said DJ. And soon, Joseph wanted to rap. Russell let Joseph record one song, which went absolutely nowhere. In the meantime, Joseph had a friend named Daryl McDaniel. The two of them wanted to rap as a duo. At first, Russell said no because he didn't like Daryl's rap style, but eventually he said yes. He also decided that they needed a DJ of their own, so they got their friend Jason Mizell. Russell then changed their nicknames. Joseph DJ Run, son of Curtis Blow, became Run. Daryl Easy D became DMC, and Jason Jazzy Jace became Jam Master J, and the group became known as Run DMC. Uh, for the record, they hated the name of the group, but it kind of grew on them after a while, I guess. Run DMC signed to Profile Records and released their first single, It's Like That. The song hit number 15 on the Billboard R&B charts. After that success, they released their first album, Run DMC, in 1984. That album had hits like Hard Times. It also had the transcending song, Rock Box, with a mixture of hip-hop and hard rock, complete with the blistering guitar of session musician Eddie Paul Martinez, the song was one of the first to combine what were, at least at that point in life, two separate worlds, black inner city hip-hop and white heavy metal. Both were considered dangerous in the eyes of the mainstream, which made them a perfect combination for the kids. 1985 was a big year for the group from a career perspective. First, they released their next album, King of Rock, which further solidified their sound with the songs King of Rock and Can You Rock It Like This. They were then the only hip-hop act to perform at Live Aid. They followed that up with an appearance in the hit movie Crush Groove. 1986 saw their biggest success with one of the most important albums of the 1980s, Raising Hell. The album was produced by Rick Rubin, who had a major role in one of the most important songs in all of music history. The album was almost done when they decided to do one more song to pique interest from their fans who liked the hard rock sounds of King of Rock and Rockbox as the rest of the album wasn't geared that way. After some discussion, they fell upon the idea of doing Walk This Way by Aerosmith, with Howie Weinberg as the mastering engineer on the track. Originally, they were going to sample the song, but Rick and Jam Master Jay wanted to redo the song completely. They put out the call to Aerosmith to gauge any interest. At first, there wasn't any. What has to be remembered is that at this point in their careers, 1985, no one liked Aerosmith. Known as the Toxic Twins at that time, Aerosmith, Steven Tyler, and Joe Perry were looked at as part of a group whose heyday was in the 1970s, and they had a lot of drugs, alcohol, and way too many internal band issues to even discuss at this point. They were pretty much at that point done as a band. Even with their careers in freefall, Steven and Joe still didn't want to do the song because they hated hip-hop. To them, and a lot of other artists, and justifiably so, really, hip-hop was taking their songs, using them without paying the artists and making money off of them, and the Toxic Twins wanted no part of it. Like I said, justifiably so. Rick convinced them, though, to come to the studio to talk things out a little bit. Once they saw how Jam Master J could cut the record precisely where he wanted the beat to be at will on the turntables, they became fascinated, and then they wanted in on the collaboration. The music video also became iconic. The video unfolds with both acts on opposite sides of a wall. Then, once Run DMC start rapping loud to the beat, 
Stephen breaks through the wall with a microphone stand, and then everybody ends up on a concert stage together as a show of solidarity. They sing, you know, kumbaya, hold hands, and join in the old Negro spiritual free it. Well, okay, not that far. But it does signify breaking down the barriers between both rock and hip-hop cultures. Rumor has it that Stephen couldn't break down the wall at first, but they left that part in the final cut. The song, the album, and the music video all became big hits, along with becoming icons in 80s music. It also gave Aerosmith their career back, as the band got back together and started putting out hit songs like Love in an Elevator, Dude Looks Like a Lady, Angel, Jaded, Don't Want to Miss a Thing, among many, many, many others, in one of the greatest musical comebacks in rock music history. After the success of Raising Hell and Walk This Way, Run DMC put out Tougher Than Leather and Down With The King, but by then, the sound that the group had pioneered had already changed, and to be honest, so did they. Run became a minister, while Jay became a producer, producing the group Onyx, who had the hit song Slam. The three guys started to not get along, and they started to go in different directions musically. In 2002, Jam Master Jay was shot and killed in his studio in Queens, New York. His murder was finally solved almost 20 years later. As for this version of the song Walk This Way, it was released on July 4th, 1986, Independence Day, at least in America. And it went top 10 in 13 different countries. It never hit number one in America, only going as high as number four on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart. It hit number eight on the Billboard R&B slash hip hop chart, which was delightfully called the Hot Black chart back then because, well, corporations were pretty insulting and racist back then. That's why. It was the 89th biggest song of 1986 and sold over one million copies in America. It also won a ton of awards, including Best Rap Single at the Soul Train Music Awards, and has ended up on many different best of lists, regardless of genre. The music video has also been cited as one of the greatest music videos of all time on more than a few best of music video lists. I don't know if the music video is one of the best, that might be kind of a stretch, but it and the song were definitely important. You have to remember the times. In the 1980s, especially the early to mid-1980s, black kids had their music, white kids had their music, and never the twain shall meet. Except for geeky music kids like me who grew up on almost everything and loved everything, including hard rock, heavy metal, and hip-hop. Rap music at the time was looked at as dangerous and pissed everybody off in the mainstream. What Run DMC did was to combine rock and rap music so that common ground was met between the races, at least for the Gen X kids like myself. It was an extremely important rung on the ladder to global acceptance for hip-hop as the Beastie Boys made rap music popular with the suburban kids, and then for better or for worse, probably for worse, MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice watered down rap music just enough to make the suburban parents accept it. At least some of it. NWA, Ice-T, Public Enemy, Body Count still scared the hell out of them. Trust me, it was funny watching them. Run DMC's iconic version of Aerosmith's song, Walk This Way, released on the 4th of July. July 4th, 1986. Next, the debut single from a group that had a mythical career. The alternative rock group R.E.M. started out in the college town of Athens, Georgia, which was home to another groundbreaking group, the B-52s. College student Peter Buck was working at Wuck Street Records in 1980 when fellow student Michael Stipe walked in. The two of them struck up a conversation and realized that they liked the same type of music. And the two soon-to-be friends then met students Mike Mills and Bill Berry. After realizing that they all shared a love of music, 
the four guys decided to form a band together and play around town. Eventually, they started to get serious about music, so they ended up ditching college. The name R.E.M. was picked out of a dictionary by Michael Stipe and is short for Rapid Eye Movement, which is the dreamlike state when you sleep. The group got a local manager and went to work making a name for themselves by touring in the southern United States. The problem that they found was that since they were one of the pioneers of alternative rock music, they had to build the genre's infrastructure as clubs weren't really open to having alternative rock groups at that time. So while they kept things lean by doing things like having only $2 per day food allowance, they built up their fan base the old-fashioned way. They started with word of mouth and then passed around bootleg tapes of their performances along with playing for college rock radio stations. On July 8th, 1981, R.E.M. put out their first single, Radio Free Europe, off of their EP, Chronic Town. Mike Easter from the local band Let's Active was the producer with all of the members of the group writing the song and was recorded at Drive-In Studio in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Mike Mills came up with an idea for the song while fooling around on his guitar in a record store. Peter Buck then took the song and worked on it. Bill Berry and added his part to it, and Michael Stipe did the lyrics. That, according to a recent interview they did for CBS News, was how they wrote most of their songs in their, their career. Radio Free Europe was recorded on April 15, 1981, and set the template for how college indie bands did business in the early 1980s, setting the stage for the American alternative rock music of the 1980s and 90s. This song got the attention of independent record label IRS Records, who signed them to a contract in 1982 and got them right to work recording at Reflection Studios in Charlotte, North Carolina. After clashing with their first producer, Stephen Haig, the group was able to work with Don Dixon and Mitch Easter, who worked on Chronic Town with them. Recording sessions started in January of 1983, took less than eight weeks to finish, and was mixed and mastered in March of 1983 due to the fact that a lot of the songs were already written at that point. In keeping with their ad hoc way of doing things, they experimented with different microphone positions, using guitar reverb, and putting drums in a different room for recording. The result was the critically acclaimed debut album Murmur, released the very next month in April 1983. Their follow-up album Reckoning was done almost the same way and with the same two producers. Reckoning was recorded in December 1983 in Charlotte, North Carolina again, and it took only 16 days to record. The first eight days of the month, then a two-week break to play a gig, then another eight days to finish the album. Reckoning, which was released in April 1984, was a lot darker in mood than Murmur, with themes of alienation and loss weaving their way across the album. Nonetheless, Reckoning was also a big success, both with the critics and with the public. Their third album, Fables of the Reconstruction, is considered by many critics to be one of the group's masterpieces, but it didn't come so easy this time. Joe Boyd came in as producer, and Joe was known for being a bit of a perfectionist on his albums, which clashed with R.E.M.'s style of recording. Still, Fables was recorded relatively quickly, with the session starting at Air Studios in London, England in March of 1985, with the album being released in June of 85. Again, it was a critical and commercial success, both in America and the UK, where it became their first charting UK album, peaking at number 11. The fourth album, Life's Rich Pageant, was different in many ways from their earlier albums. For starters, it marked a shift from their post-punk emo alternative rock and more towards a more hard rock style of alternative, you might say. Second, it was the first album where you could actually hear what Michael Stipe was singing, as his vocals previously were almost buried on his songs and he was usually mumbling. New producer Don Gaiman 
got Michael to sing more clearly this time around. And actually, if you listen to the first few albums, you can kind of tell he, he sounds muffled. Life was recorded at John Mellencamp's Belmont Mall Studios in Indiana. They started recording in April 1986, finished it in May, and released it in July. This was the first album that got them more of a foothold into the mainstream Top 40 radio, although they wouldn't get their first Top 10 song until their next album. That next album, Document, was recorded in March and April 1987 at Sound Emporium Studios in Nashville, Tennessee, with new producer Scott Litt. The album was released in August of 1987 and became a top 10 album with R.E.M. classics The One I Love, It's the End of the World as We Know It, and I Feel Fine, and Finest Work Song. It was also their last independent release with IRS Records as R.E.M. then signed with major record label Warner Brothers. IRS did put out the group's successful Greatest Hits album, Eponymous, as their last album to satisfy that contract. Side note, It's the End of the World as We Know It was very cleverly put into the 1996 blockbuster movie Independence Day as the song that was being played when the scientists discovered the radio signal that announced the alien's presence. The first album that was released uh, for Warner Brothers was Green. That one was recorded at Arden Studios in late May to early July 1988 with Scott Lynn back at the helm, then was mixed and mastered at Bearsville Sound Studio in Bearsville, New York, until early September. The bet that Warner Brothers made on R.E.M. paid off when Green was released in November 1988 and hit number 12 on the album's chart. Bearsville Sound Studios was the primary location for the recording of the album that would turn R.E.M. from just guys who some people knew into superstars. That album, Out of Time. Out of Time, which was also partially recorded at John Keane Studio in Athens, Georgia, took longer to produce than most of their other albums, as they spent most of 1990 working up the songs and then recording them with Scott Lynn starting in September of 1990. They spent a lot of time experimenting with different genres, from the funk rap of radio song with guest artist KRS-One, to having Kate Pearson on guest vocals for Shiny Happy People, Kate Pearson being from the B-52s. And they also did a little psychedelic rock for the song Belong. And to add a little extra to that sauce, they then mixed the album at Prince's Studio, Paisley Park Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On March 12, 1991, Out of Time was released. Led by the chart-topping smash hit single, Losing My Religion, the album became one of the biggest-selling albums of the 1990s and cemented R.E.M. as the kings of alternative rock, a genre that would rule the musical landscape for the 1990s. The album won three Grammy Awards, including Best Alternative Album, while the music video for Losing My Religion, which was filmed like artistic paintings, won the group numerous MTV Video Music Awards. While they were finishing up work on Out of Time, R.E.M. started work on their next album, Automatic for the People. They started writing songs in December 1990, started recording demos at Paisley Park Studios in June of 1991, with the formal recording starting in September 91 at Ocean Way Recording Studios in Los Angeles. Scott Lynn again guided them through this album, with string arrangements to some of the songs being handled by bassist John Paul Jones of Led Zeppelin fame. Okay, who knew that John Paul Jones really had that talent in his arsenal? Who knew? Man's a master. When released, Automatic for the People became another smash hit, going to number one on the album's charts worldwide and spawning hit songs Drive, Man on the Moon, and Everybody Hurts. Another side note, Man on the Moon was a tribute to the late comedian and actor Andy Kaufman, and the song became the title for the 1999 movie about Andy Kaufman that starred Jim Carrey and was also a part of the movie's soundtrack. 
Their next album, Monster, took a different route to success than the other albums. After tasting mainstream and major label success with more melodic songs, the group wanted something more aggressive and raw this go-around. They wanted to take their artistic frustration and anger at the music industry through their songs and to also deal with the death of their close friend, actor River Phoenix, who passed away from a drug overdose on Halloween night 1993, along with the death of another friend, Kurt Cobain of Nirvana, on April 5th, 1994. Monster was recorded at Kingsway Studios in New Orleans starting in February 1994 before moving to Crossover Soundstage in Atlanta, Georgia in March of that year before finally finishing in June. It was released on September 27, 1994 behind the hits What's the Frequency Kenneth and Crush Eye Liner. Monster became another huge hit. You might say it was a monster and won the band four Grammy Awards. In 1995, while on the road to support Monster, R.E.M. took eight track recorders with them and recorded their next album, New Adventures in Hi-Fi, as they wanted to capture the energy that they felt while on the road. They finished the album at Bad Animal Studios in Seattle, Washington, and had vocal help from the legendary Miss Patti Smith on the song Ebo the Letter. This time around, the mixing duties would be handled not only by stalwart producer Scott Lynn at Sunset Sound in Los Angeles, but also by Pat McCarthy at Louis Clubhouse in Los Angeles and John Keane at John Keane Studios in Athens, Georgia, and also at a studio in Portland, Maine. New Adventures would be released in September 1996 and become another huge hit, although it didn't sell as many copies as their other 90s albums. It also marked a few milestones in the band's personal lives. First, they re-signed their contract with Warner Brothers Records. Then, the group decided to let their longtime manager, Jefferson Holt, go due to alleged sexual harassment charges against him by one of the band's employees. Then... Drummer Bill Berry decided to quit the band due to a lot of health problems, having had a brain aneurysm while on stage in 1995 during a concert. After a couple of decades of laying low and becoming a farmer, Bill joined a new group, The Bad Seeds, in 2022. He still did reunions with R.E.M. every now and then. To say that Bill's departure led to the band's downfall would be pretty harsh, since it probably had more to do with the changing winds of the ever-fickle music industry than Bill's departure did. Still, Bill was a major part of the band's creative process, and without him, the group kind of missed something. They continued on, releasing 1998's Up, 2001's Reveal, 2004's Around the Sun, 2008's Accelerate, and 2011's Collapse Into Now. However, none of them hit platinum status, with the last three not even hitting gold status in America. That's 500,000 copies sold. The remaining members of the band amicably called it quits in 2011 after deciding that the band, after 31 years, had run its course. They've also put out special projects and done interviews to push books, anniversary editions of their albums and such. However, there has been no official reunion album or concert tour, and I suspect that there never will be. It's not just not really their style. As they've said recently in an interview to commemorate the fact that they were just accepted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2024, they said, why bother? It's not the same. Then, however, during that actual Songwriters Hall of Fame ceremony, REM reunited and they performed one song, Losing My Religion, and Reunion Done. When they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, by the way, Bill Berry joined them to accept his award, and at that point, they performed three songs with the group. R.E.M. ended up releasing 15 studio albums, five live albums, six EPs, and 16 compilation albums. Of those, all of the studio albums hit the top 40, 
with all but six of them hitting the top ten, with Out of Time and Monster hitting number one, and Accelerate, New Adventures, and Automatic hitting number two. They also released 63 singles. Of those, 20 hit the top ten, with ten hitting number one. The group won numerous awards, including Grammy Awards and MTV Video Music Awards. They were also very known for being very outspoken on social and humanitarian issues, as well as in local politics in their old stomping grounds of Athens, Georgia. The absolutely incredible career of R.E.M., which all started with the release of their debut single, Radio Free Europe on July 8th, 1981. Normally, we put all of the passings together in one little segment. However, these particular two have something kind of in common. These two are legends. There's one date. They're two years apart but they have a lot of controversy. First, Brian Jones was a key member of the Rolling Stones. While Mick Jagger and Keith Richards wrote most of the music, Brian was the one who gave the Stones their signature sound. He experimented with the sitar and any other instrument he thought might set them apart from other bands. Brian's problem, though, was that he was also a partier of Olympic gold medal caliber. His drug and alcohol addictions were so extreme that even Mick and Keith thought he was out of control. Now that's saying something considering how many drugs those two took. He also had a reputation for being a misogynist and for being a whiny little brat, which definitely did not help him with the rest of the band, at least the whiny brat part. The problem was that while they all partied like they were going to die that day, At least it didn't affect their day jobs. Until, of course, it started to. Brian started showing up to recording sessions either late or not even at all. If he did end up showing up, he was usually way too wasted, so as far as the recording sessions went, he was pretty much useless. The Stones also wanted to play the United States in the fall of 1969. However, due to a drug conviction that Brian had, he was denied a United States visa. A decision had to finally be made. And on June 8, 1969, the Rolling Stones fired Brian Jones. Jones went to his house to regroup and to plan his next move which mainly meant getting wasted. On July 3rd, 1969, Brian Jones was found dead at the bottom of his swimming pool. The official cause of death was listed as, quote, death by misadventure, end quote. What the coroner meant by this statement was that it was an accidental drowning brought on by either drugs or alcohol or possibly a combination of both. That death by misadventure line, however, sent conspiracy theory nuts into overdrive. And ever since that day, they've blamed everyone from Mick and Keith to even going as far as blaming the British Secret Service for Brian's death. Whatever the reason, what can't be argued is that the world lost an amazing talent who unfortunately just had way too many demons to conquer. The death of Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones on July 3rd, 1969, at the age of 27. Next, Jim Morrison's death sent similar shockwaves through the conspiracy community, At the time of his death, his group The Doors were riding pretty high. They had released a bunch of albums, all of them top commercial and critical successes. Jim, however, was beginning to court trouble, sometimes literally. At a concert in Miami, Florida, Jim asked the audience if they wanted him to expose himself. That was enough to send the cops crazy. They arrested him and charged him with exposing himself, among other charges. The truth was that he never actually exposed himself and that the charges were kind of made up. Regardless, 
he was soon found guilty. Jim decided that while he was out on bail, he would go to Paris to unwind and to escape. Probably more to escape than anything. He and his girlfriend, Pamela Corson, apparently enjoyed Paris, going on long walks, writing poetry, etc., etc. They also got married in a Celtic ceremony, though there were originally charges that it was not legit. However, on July 3rd, 1971, exactly two years to the day of Brian Jones's death, Jim's girlfriend found Jim dead in their bathtub in Paris. And here is where this story gets all sorts of weird. For starters, there was never any autopsy done. French law at the time didn't require it, so they never did it. At most, the coroner did a quick examination and said that the cause of death was a drug-induced heart attack. For her part, His girlfriend changed her story so many times that to this very day, no one really knows the truth. One day, she said that Jim never did drugs. The next day, she said that he did, but not on that day. He took heroin, but not cocaine or the other way around. In any event, on April 25th, 1974, Pamela Corson passed away herself from a heroin overdose at the age of 27 as well. So no one's going to be asking her any questions about it anymore, that's for sure. Some people, of course, think that Morrison faked his own death since he was about to go to jail in Florida and that he was just hanging on an island somewhere with Biggie, Tupac, uh, Hendrix, Elvis, whoever else. After all, Jim was the Lizard King. He could do anything. Much like Brian Jones, the hard truth is that on July 3rd, 1971, the world lost yet another talent way too soon when Jim Morrison passed away, yes, at the age of 27, joining the infamous 27 Club with Brian Jones. Go figure. As always, though, we end on a happy note with a birthday and a couple of honorable mentions. On July 8th, 1970, a boy was born in Los Angeles, California to a family of visual artists. His mother was a member of the Andy Warhol factory. His dad was a composer. He grew up very poor. He first lived off of Hollywood Boulevard and then lived in another poor Hollywood neighborhood that had Asian and South American refugees. He spent time in Kansas where he picked up an appreciation for gospel music and he even lived for a time in Europe before coming back to America. And all this was before he hit the age of 10. When he came back to America, he lived back in Los Angeles. He started to become influenced by all sorts of music, from hip-hop to Latin music to punk music. He applied to the high school for the performing arts, but was turned down. At this point, he learned how to play the guitar, and he learned how to play blues and folk music. He hung out at the local college, got into jazz music, and took jobs loading trucks, among many other small-time work jobs. He would also become a street musician, playing blues and country music. And all that was before he hit the age of 19. One day, he decided to go live in his mother's old stomping grounds of New York City. He spent almost a year being homeless, sleeping on people's couches, doing the occasional odd job. He also got into the art house music scene and made some friends. And within that year, he grew sick of New York and moved back to L.A. He lived in a shed and worked in a video store. He went back to being a street musician again, and he also got into the art house scene out there. During one of his shows, someone offered to help him record some demo tracks. He started passing around the demos until the demos found their way to an independent record label. The record label offered to help him make a small album and hooked him up with hip-hop producer Carl Stevenson. Among the work that they did together was a hip-hop influence song with a lot of slide guitar. After having to be convinced, he agreed to let the song be released, with him having no faith in the song itself because to him, as he said in an interview once, he kind of thought that the song sucked. 
The song, however, became a huge hit, and soon major record labels started bidding for his services. And the rest is history. Over the past few decades, he has put out some of the most inventive, creative music out there. Two of his albums made Rolling Stone magazine's greatest albums of all time list. He took all of the music that he was influenced by when he was growing up and put his own spin on it. You never know what you're going to get from this guy next. The song that started his career, by the way, was Loser, which became one of the biggest songs of the 1990s. So, a humongously large, big happy birthday to one of the most creative men in music and a high school for the performing arts reject, Beck, who was born on July 8th, 1970. And there are two honorable mentions to finish this podcast off, since it is a long one this week. Lots going on. First off, on July 7, 2007, the Live Earth charity concerts, which were 12 concerts on seven continents to call attention to climate change, took place. We are not going to deep dive into them because we've got Live Aid coming up in next week's podcast since that was held on July 13th, 1985, and we did a deep dive into Live Aid's sequel, 2005's Live 8 concerts in last week's podcast, which you should really check out, like, and subscribe. Helps the algorithm. Live Earth was put on by the same people with the same issues as the other two, but with some good music, so they're getting a mention here because, you know, 12 concerts, seven continents, one day. The Live Earth Concerts on July 7th, 2007. Finally, on July 8th, 1947, people reported seeing a UFO in Roswell, New Mexico, near the Area 51 military base. That one singular event has since spawned many, many conspiracy theories, along with many songs about aliens, including David Bowie's Starman, Megadeth's Hangar 18, and of course, Debbie Harry's rap in Blondie's song Rapture about the man from Mars eating cars, and even great movies with great soundtracks, like John Williams' film scores to E.T. and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The Roswell, New Mexico, UFO, weather balloon, insert your own crazy conspiracy theory here, incident that inspired way too many music and pop culture references to list here, including the X-Files, great show with great music, on July 8th, 1947. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for July 3rd through the 9th. Please like, subscribe. It helps the algorithm out quite a bit. And thank you very, very much for listening.